as is always the truth, it is a wonderful joy and privilege to be with you. And what a truly glorious day it is to be joined together uh, in our incomplete and yet beginning to be assembled worship of our Lord. As we uh, begin this morning, we will be continuing in our exposition of Matthew. We've been away for a little while, and I'm extremely excited to get back to that. We're going to be in chapter 22. And this morning, we're going to be considering the greatness of love. The greatness of love. It's a word which is very often used in our generation, in our time. But I would also say that it is a very misunderstood and sadly very abused word. But in spite of that, it is a great word nonetheless. It is a truly gift from the, a true gift from the Lord that we have love that both we have received and can share. As we prepare this morning, I'm excited that our little listeners are in with us. Uh, they've put together, some of our folks have put together a table in the back uh, that has given resources and other things available to them during the service time. But for each of us this morning, but them especially, our main point that I want you to pay attention for throughout this is that we love God because He first loved us and true love is always lived out. We love God because He first loved us, and true love is always lived out. If you're in Matthew in chapter 22, we're going to be beginning in verse 34, but as we prepare to do that, let me just remind us, we've been away for a few weeks, and I want to remind us of the setting for our text. This is likely Wednesday of the Passion Week of our Lord, and this is amazing when you think through this. It is literally two days before his crucifixion, of which he is fully aware. There's no part of him where he's not aware of what's coming. This is two days before his crucifixion, and he is sitting with the very men who most want to murder him. He is teaching. He is sharing. He is walking through truth. He is facing the confrontation as they test him and try and entrap him. Two days before his known crucifixion, and here he is, still doing what he's been doing. Now, the other thing to understand about that context, when we oftentimes speak in terms of, of what was the mindset of the Pharisees, we can't separate out that two days from now, they are going to, through their endeavors, see our Lord hung upon the cross. This is the level of hatred that is literally percolating within the hearts of those who are testing and confronting him. Listen, at this time, as in all times, it is shown in varying degrees of intensity, but this is what is in the heart of the great majority of these who are in all of these scenes that we have been studying together in these final chapters, in these closing chapters of Matthew. They hated him to the degree that it was their intention. They were seeking a means by which they could murder him. That's already been stated with clarity. And they're trying to do away with him. They're seeking that means, but they are faced with a few struggles. There's a few struggles in the midst of it. Number one, they were limited by Rome's authority. Part of the rule of Rome was that they could not act alone. They did not have the authority of execution. They were not given that authority by Rome who was governing over them. They did not have the authority of execution. And number two, the people of Israel, they didn't know what to think of Jesus. Remember, the crowds had just welcomed him into the city with palm branches laid before him and shouts of acclamation and recognition. They did not know what to think of him because they had seen, the crowds had seen his power. They had recognized his authority. And so the leadership feared the response of the people if they would have just taken him. And so the response, their, their way to work through this has been to try and entrap Jesus. We've recognized that in these questions that they're asking, these tests that they're giving to him, they wanted to publicly discredit him with Rome. So they asked him a politically divisive question about, about taxes and submission to the Roman government. They asked him a question that would be sure to bring hostility to the forefront and possibly, if he answered the way that they maybe anticipated, possibly put him at odds with Rome who did have 
the authority and had already proven themselves willing to use it to the execution of one who would speak against Caesar or the taxation. So they wanted to discredit him before Rome. And so they asked him a politically divisive question about taxes and submission to the Roman government. They also wanted to publicly discredit him with the Jewish people. So they had also asked him a theologically divisive question about the resurrection as the Sadducees came forward asking this question in the presence of all. Jesus had thus far silenced and shamed his critics. I use that term shamed because it's interesting where we left off in this. We, we recognize and we see it here in verse 34 as we begin this morning that when it says Jesus had silenced the Sadducees, it means that they had nothing further they could speak. It's not that they were convinced. It's not that they went away saying, oh my goodness, he's right. We're going to change our views. He had silenced them. He had muzzled them, so to speak, with the depth and wisdom of his response. We're now moving into their final attempt this day as they test him again by asking a third question. And this third question regards the moral order of the commandments. It's a familiar text. We, we, we are probably those who have heard this more than a few times. What is the greatest commandment? That's the section we're in today. And so look at this just for a moment. This is the three questions that they brought to him. They brought him one involving politics by a beleaguered nation under the rule of another, which was absolutely a firestorm in the making. They came to him as a religious people asking him a question of theology and now they're coming with an issue of morality. I mean, think about this just for a minute. They are covering every base that is a common divider of men. Read this short section with me, beginning in verse 34 of Matthew 22. But when the Pharisees heard that Jesus had silenced the Sadducees, they gathered themselves together, and one of them, a lawyer, asked him a question, testing him. Teacher, which is the great commandment in the law. And he said to him, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the great and foremost commandment. The second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend the whole law and the prophets. You know, for, and I'm afraid this happens too frequently. When we have a familiar text, we sadly, miss how great it is. I don't want to say that it becomes mundane, but it becomes common. This idea of the greatest commandment, I shall love the Lord your God. We've probably heard that if you grew up in any sense of a, of a religious or Christian setting or a Christian home or a Christian environment. You've heard that many, many times. But I'm afraid that oftentimes, because we're so familiar with it, it just kind of goes in one ear and out the other. And one of the things that I've recognized in our exposition of a gospel specifically is that there's so much that is common because we miss the context. There's so many times that we take something out of context and we know it well, but we miss everything that is surrounding it. Our characters are a crowd which hated Jesus. The Pharisees, the scribes, the Sadducees, the religious leadership of the Jews hated Jesus. The parallel section, and I want to make this clear as we consider the weight of this, the response of Christ is so amazing that I don't want us to just take, well, Jesus said, love the Lord your God. No, there's so much more that leads up to this. For just a moment, though, I do want to address the parallel section in Mark's account seems to give this particular questioner a little bit more of a benign approach. In Mark 12, 28, you don't have to turn there, I'll just read it. One of the scribes came and heard them arguing and recognizing that he had answered them well, asked him what command is the foremost of all. And so it seems to be that Mark would have seen this scene or have heard of this scene and, and recorded it in such a way that, that kind of gives a little bit of benign leniency to this particular scribe, that he recognized that he answered him well uh, in those things. And so he came maybe with a more legitimate Teach me, O Lord, mindset, which we have not seen. But Matthew, Matthew records it very clearly. The Pharisees had gathered together, seeing that the, the Sadducees had been silenced, which would have brought them a little bit of joy, uh, but not too much because their greater desire would have been the silencing of Christ. 
And so they gathered together, and then this man came and asked another question, testing him, testing him in this. And so I want us to understand that there's no contradiction here. Mark calls him a scribe, which simply is, is a title of one who is a copier, interpreter, and oftentimes teacher of the law. Now, Matthew uses a word which is unusual for him. Actually, he only uses it in this verse in his entire gospel. And we translated it as lawyer, which is not wrong. But a more literal translation would be a law expert. A law expert. And what I recognize in Matthew's unusual usage is that he recognizes that this fellow was a cut above the others in his knowledge, expertise, and likely thoughtfulness. Possibly it was in his means of, of how he could test or, or trick Jesus. But whatever the case may be, this is a recognized law expert among those who were the Pharisees and the scribes. This is one who is a cut above the rest. This question clearly labeled, as Matthew recognizes, was a continued means to test or entrap our Lord by his words. This was a means to discredit him, to alienate him. Because think about this. He minced no words. There was no philosophical background. He came and asked before a crowd for a definitive answer to a question that will always have disagreement. Consider the question, and let's just put it in common terms for us today. If you gather a crowd and you ask them, what is the greatest anything, you're going to have division. Who's the greatest basketball player of all times? Who's the greatest sports team? What's the greatest fishing lure? Listen, anytime that a definitive type of question is asked in a crowd, division will occur. There was no mincing of words or mistake in what had been asked. This expert in the law, this law expert, came from among the Pharisees to our Lord with a question to entrap or test him by trying to ask in such a way that it would divide a crowd. Man, these guys don't give up. It was interesting in reading a little bit of Spurgeon on this. He exhorts us to emulate the Pharisees in their persistence and perseverance, but for us to do so for the Lord rather than against him. So the context surrounding this is a hostile context. Jesus has cleansed the temple. He has cursed the tree. He has told three judgment parables where the Pharisees knew they were speaking about him and made that clear. They then bring to the forefront their means of entrapping him. And this is where we find ourselves in this text. The question that is asked opens the door to and for hostility. And in recognizing that, my goodness... Our Lord is amazing in his response, which displays absolute wisdom in not dividing those who are there while also teaching with clarity and authority what is the truth to the question that was asked. This morning, as we consider the greatness of love, I'm going to look at three simple points together with you from our text. Number one, there is nothing new in this world. There's nothing new in this world. And the next two, you can probably guess. Number two, love God. And number three, love men. Let's start with the first one from our Lord's response. There is nothing new in this world. This is so important for us as believers. It's so important for us when we consider God's word, when we look at the culture around us, and we consider how we are to view culture through the lens of Scripture, how we're to view circumstances through the lens of Scripture, that we would be careful to never reverse that, where we begin then to view Scripture through the lens of culture or circumstances. And in this, our Lord's response shows a great wisdom that will help guard and guide us in our lives that we are called to live. He quoted to them a very familiar truth that they all already knew. He didn't give them some obscure philosophical answer. He did not say and mince words and, and beat around the bush. He took them to something that was extremely familiar. He quoted from Deuteronomy 6, verses 4 and 5. It's on your screen. Here's what he quoted to them. Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God. The Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. Now again, we can see that this is an almost exact quote that Christ gives. But what you may not realize, if you don't have a 
Hebrew or Jewish background that this text is part of what's known as the Shema. The Shema is, is Hebrew for, for hear, because as we see in this text, it begins with the words, Hear, O Israel. The Shema is that which is to be recited daily in Hebrew or Jewish religious life. It was that which was written on the phylacteries and the, that the Pharisees wore on their hands and on, or on their arms and on their heads. When you hear Jesus confront them in the next chapter, you hear him, hear him address that they wear these tassels and these phylacteries, these little boxes that contain scripture written upon them, that he confronts them with this text that they knew so well. And, and think about that scene for a minute. The expert in the law comes with this great question to ask him and entrap him. And he points them to that which was so well known. As a matter of fact, every religious person, which let's be clear, this is Passover. They are just at the temple which has been cleansed. Jesus is teaching. There are no unreligious people gathered in this crowd. This is a Jewish crowd who would have recognized immediately. As I said before, every faithful Jew recited the Shema twice a day. And this was a part of it. This was the beginning of the Shema that they would recite twice a day. And Jesus, can you imagine that? It's like when, when one of your children comes and they're asking a question that they know the answer to. Right? We've experienced that. It, it's like when you're looking for your glasses and you realize they're on your head. It's that moment of what on earth? The expert in the law came with this. In other words, Jesus was simply reminding them of what they knew. And why is that important? Well, first, in his quotation of this text, he affirms his orthodoxy, which is what they're coming to oppose him with. He affirms his orthodoxy, which he has continually affirmed, even as he began his ministry back in the Sermon on the Mount. He stated with all clarity that he came to fulfill, not to abolish, that not one jot nor tittle, not one stroke nor dot would go from the law because of him. It's such an important truth for us in understanding this, but he affirms it here, and he reminds them of what they claim to believe. That's important for us. He reminds them of what they claimed to believe. This seems so mundane, but I assure you it is not. These men and and these women who were gathered there, they knew this truth. Brothers and sisters, they wore this truth. They hung it on their walls and they spoke it daily, constantly to themselves and to others. But did they believe it? Did they practice it? You see, these are the questions that matter. These are the questions that matter. These are the questions that we have to ask. Not, do you know it? Not, do you display it in your apparel? Not, do you have it around your home? And not, do you even speak of it? When it comes to the Word of God, to the commands of God, do you believe it to the point of doing it? That's what's before us. Those are the questions that matter. And too many today... We're looking for something new. And I want us to understand as our Lord is confronted with this massively important scene, moments and literally days till his crucifixion, till the hour that the Lord had promised and put in place before the foundation of the earth, moments before that, this is what he brings to them. As they bring the best they've got to try and entrap and and, and catch him, he brings them the same old thing. He brings them something that they knew. He reminded them of what they already knew. And I want us to understand there is nothing new. There is nothing new. We, they, we all seem to want new revelation. And we want to have a new discovery, something, something new that no one's thought of so we can write a new book on a new th- version, a new view of. We want to have a new ethic that's, that's more compatible with the culture that we live in and up to date to the things that we desire. We want to have a new experience, right? We, we want to experience something new. We grew up in Christianity and it's got kind of boring. And so we want, to, we want to spice it up a little bit with some new experience. Maybe it's a new religion. It's amazing to me how oftentimes people denounce or change what is their claim of faith. Maybe it's a new hero. 
I really like this guy. I, I, I really, you know, this guy has really enlightened me to new things. I really like everything. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to follow this guy. Maybe it's a new reality. Right? How many times do we see that where, where someone just wants a new reality? They're not content with who they are, what they have, they, the circumstances that have come against them. They, they just want to get a new reality. Well, the truth is, brothers and sisters, the reality exists as it is. Hey, the reality exists as it is, and there's no greener grass. You're not going to move your life over a little bit or, or start this new thing as it pertains to the life around you, and suddenly everything's going to be better. Hey, I've had to face that before in conversations regarding churches. Considering this among those who are in seminary and preparing to graduate and, and take on roles of ministry, is it better to plant than it is to revitalize a ministry? Guys, they both have their struggles, but here's the thing to understand that I've come to realize. Whether you plant or whether you labor to revitalize in a ministry that is struggling, within five to ten years you will be in the same place. It's the same thing. We don't get new realities. We simply labor in the ones we're given. And sadly, there's oftentimes, at the end of all of these trails, a desire for a new gospel. A gospel that doesn't deal with sin. A gospel that doesn't demand repentance. A gospel that does not recognize being born again, the regenerating reality that only God himself accomplishes. And I want to say to you this morning, there is nothing new. There is nothing that trumps what is already given. And Hebrews says, chapter 10, it says that those who continue in sin, hoping for a new sacrifice, continue in vain. There is no greater or further sacrifice coming. Those who look to Christ and say, I like you, but not that much, which is very common. We, we see it in the crowds. The crowds were amazed by Christ, but they were not faithful to follow Christ. They liked what he offered to them in power and healing and those things, but they were not those who trusted him by faith. There's a new gospel oftentimes, and I want you to understand there is nothing new. Now, that's not to say that Scripture doesn't speak in results of newness. There is newness that awaits those who have been redeemed from sin unto everlasting life. There is a newness of life, a new creation reality that begins from there and progresses forward in that newness. There is a new day awaiting us every day in which we can then begin to apply and experience the truths of God. Praise God as compassions are new every morning. That whatever today is, we awake tomorrow to both a new day of compassion from the Lord, but also a new fight in our sanctification. That means that whatever failures you experienced yesterday, you begin again today. If you've gone to the Lord in repentance and been cleansed from that sin, you can start fresh. Whatever victories you experienced yesterday, also mean you have to wake up today to continue fighting. We do not rest on yesterday's laurels. There's nothing new. This is the gospel. It comes down to this, brothers and sisters. Have you believed that Jesus is the Son of God and that He loved you and gave Himself for you that you might be redeemed unto the Lord your God? Do you believe that He proved these truths in His resurrection? Have you believed that in his redemption, he made you a new creation and gave you a new heart which loves him back? Have you believed that he has given you victory over sin and that he commands you to exercise that victory while we serve him as our master until he returns? It's a major statement, but it's straight out of scripture. It's clearly worded throughout scripture. Have you believed that he has given you a mission to proclaim him and make his name famous? And that someday soon each of us will stand before him as master and receive the recompense for our actions done here in the flesh. See, there's nothing new. As much as we might like to tweak and change and adapt and adopt, there is nothing new. And anything that we do to this leaves us looking as foolish on that day when we stand before the Lord, as this expert in the law looked on this day when he stood before the Lord and said, what's the greatest command? And the Lord said, the one you're wearing on your forehead, the one you've wrapped around your arm, the one you've already quoted at least once today and will quote again before the day is over. Do not 
come to that place? (laughs) Do we live out these beliefs? The Pharisees knew the truth. But it's obvious that they didn't believe it. We can clearly see this from their actions. Now, nobody likes having their actions viewed through a subjective lens after the fact. Nobody likes having their actions viewed through a subjective lens after the fact. And that's what we're able to do with these scenes. I am confident that the Pharisees were convinced that they had justification in their opposition. To to give you one simple example, consider Saul. Consider Saul on the Damascus Road as Christ confronted him in his opposition. And Saul's response is, who are you, Lord? Who who are you? How How have I come against you? How have I opposed you? Saul was opposing the Lord, even as he thought he was radically serving him. In other words, it is so important for us to learn from these lessons we can look back on because we equally so can easily blind ourselves by our accurate recitations and our accurate affiliations. But the question always comes down to, in its simplest form, are you trusting in the unchanging God of his unchanging word? That is how we know that we know that we know. Jesus gave them a well-known truth. But the question is, were they doing it? So we'll spend the rest of our time, what what was this truth? What was this well-known truth? Well, the simplicity of it is, is shocking. He's speaking to the religious leaders of Israel, the chosen people of God in the temple in Jerusalem, the, the ones who were overseeing all things that were being given to the people. And he says, here's the greatest command, love God. Love God. Look at verses 37 and 38 of, of chapter 22. And he said to him, no pretense. He doesn't build it up. He's like, hey, you want to take a guess? He just says to him, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the great and foremost commandment. You know, if we take all the noise away, if we take all the muddiness that we bring to the table, if we take all of our sin and all of our culture and all of our circumstances away and we just read and believe God's word for what it says, it really is super clear. It's not difficult to understand the clarity and simplicity of God's word. Jesus lays it out. And he says, look, this is what true love looks like. One commentator notes that the term here is agapeo, which is, in his words, the love of intelligence. It's the love of purpose. It's the love of will, as opposed to phileo, which is the love of emotion or affection, or eros, which is oftentimes translated love also, which is the love of the physical. He goes on and says, this is the highest kind of love. The love of purpose, the love of will, the noblest, purest, highest, self-sacrificing love of that which is right and that which is worthy. When it says in terms of you shall love the Lord your God, this is the love that is being expressed. The listing of the means of love is no separation, but it rather signals the encompassing reality of this love. So many times people try and break down Each of these, well, what does it mean to love God with all your heart versus all your soul? And they separate them out because the Lord himself has separated them out. And it's true, he did. And there is value with considering each role that's on display here in the love that we're to have for God. But what I want us to understand more importantly than that is that it is giving an all-encompassing picture. Too often, we see love trying to be parsed or separated out in categories. I love the way you look, but not your speech. I love your dedication, but not you fill in the blank. To be clear, we recognize in our own relationships that it is not true love when someone loves with their eyes and their flesh, but not with their heart. It's not true love when someone loves with their heart, but not their eyes. It's not true love that's carried out in all ways when when we think about it in terms of, well, my heart loves them I'm forced to their family their whatever it might be but my mind despises them I can't stand to be around them and you fill in the blank that's not true love a separated love or divided love is not a true love when we love someone rightly we love them 
That's the nature of what's on display. We love that person. We love everything about them but or except that which is sinful. That's the only distinction that's given. We help them with that. We forgive them, but we never love their sin. And we do not want them to love our sin. Now, when it comes to loving God, he has no sin. When it comes to loving God, he has no sin. So what Jesus is making clear is that there are no separated categories to love. But this is an all-encompassing love that embodies everything and all that we are. And so the question becomes very simple. Is that the way in which you love God? That's the question for us today. Do you love God with an all-encompassing love? Have you separated out categories where you, you love God with your mind and with your heart, but not with your body? You love God with your heart, but not really with your mind. Have you separated out this love of God in a way that becomes less than what Jesus is describing here? Listen, it's such an important thing. Do you love God with your intellect? Do you love God with your emotion? How do you love God with your intellect? Well, it comes down to, have you ever had that argument in your mind when sin is before you? Have you ever had that argument in your mind where you're sitting here saying, I know God's will for me or God's plan for me or God's commands for me are not this, but you have that argument of, well, but he won't mind. Well, but it's not a big deal. Everybody's doing it. Whatever the argument, whatever form it takes, that's not loving God. That's it's the opposite of. That's looking at God and saying, no, I don't love you. I don't trust you. I don't have faith in you. I have faith in me. You have said this is not good for me, but I believe this is good for me. You have said this is not the best for me, but I believe this is better for me than what you have for me. That's what we say in those moments. Do you love God with your intellect? Do you love him with your emotion? Do you love him with that which is inside of you? Does, do thoughts of God bring these things to the surface? Do singing the truths about God bring these? It doesn't mean that you have to shed tears or other things, but each of us have emotion. Each of us display it differently, so certainly there's no blanket statement of this is a sign of a proper emotive before the Lord, but you know your own emotion, and the question becomes, does God invoke, does your love for God invoke in you an emotive response to Him? And maybe more than all of that, do you love Him with your entire being and purpose of life? Do you love Him with your entire being and purpose of life. We, we don't get to love God on Sundays, but not on Mondays. We don't get to love God in our home, but not in our business. We don't get to love God when others are around, but not when we're alone. You see, the question becomes clear, and it's put before them in this way. This is the greatest command. Love the Lord your God with everything that comprises you whether it be your soul, which is the eternal reality of who you are, whether it be your mind, which is the thinking part of who you are, whether it be your heart, which in the Bible means everything that is the seat of yourself, the totality of you. Now think about this. Do you love God with your intellect, your emotion, your being and purpose? Can I say to you with just simplicity, it should be. In fact, it must be, because that's how he loved you. That's the love that he brings to the table. Have you considered that truth? God gave us his all. God gave us his best. God gave us himself. God gave us his beloved, that he crushed his son for you and I. God's love was not separated. It was not categorized. God's love that was given to those who are his is an all-encompassing totalitarian love that held nothing back. His grace held nothing. There was nothing off the table. There was nothing that Christ did not give. He gave his everything. He nailed it to the cross and suffered for us that we might have his richness he, he became poor that we might become rich. He gave his life that we might have life. He gave everything. God's love for us is an all-encompassing love displayed in an all-encompassing action. 
He did not simply sit up in heaven and have a Trinitarian discussion about how much He really loved us. No, He put action to that love. He carried it out. We have to understand this. What we see in the Pharisees is a terrifying truth that confronts religion, that confronts religious mindsets. Recitation and knowledge are never enough. Recitation and knowledge are never enough. Too many religions today look like a marriage where the spouse would recite their vows regularly, even daily, that there's many pictures of the wedding displayed prominently around the home. They are united only by a roof and bills and children and live divided in heart and soul and mind. Too many of professing Christians' relationship with the God they profess looks in that same way. There's recitation, there's affiliation, there's pictures and a good display of things. There's all of these things, but at the core of it, there's nothing but division. There's nothing but opposition. There's nothing but opposition to the point of competition. Who can outdo in these things? Here's the simple point. A true love is an all-encompassing love. That's what true love is. A separated love? Know this ahead of time. It applies to the Lord. It applies to our own relationships. A separated love is a a divided and soon to be conquered or failed love. If you are having, if you're in a relationship that demands love, whether it be in a church body or in a marriage or in a parent to child relationship, whatever it is, and you have tried to separate out the way in which you will love that person, you are on a path that will result in failure. You are on a path that will result in the division continually working its way to the front. Jesus says it clearly. You can't have two masters. You cannot be divided in this way. We need to understand those things to understand this. True love is love that believes to the point of action. And even as we recognize and demand this from one another, and we do, don't we? There's no husband, there's no wife, there's no friend who's okay with someone who professes their love, who professes the relationship, but continually acts in a way that's denouncing of it. It doesn't take very long before the other person says, wait just a minute. I don't think that you mean what you say. I'm not seeing this truth. Well, if we demand action that backs up the words that are spoken, how much more so should our perfect and holy God demand this from us? He should. He has more than every right to. Listen, it's worth noting in this that our Lord gives these in order of importance. Love God is the great and foremost command. He makes that clear. That's the question. And he, he makes it clear. This, this is the simplicity of the answer. It's the great and foremost command. But Jesus gives them more. He could have just left it there. What's the greatest commandment? Here it is. But then he adds more to it. But before we get to that, we need to understand why this one comes first. And and our Lord makes that clear. He says, love God is the great and foremost command. The simple answer is because you cannot love your fellow man until you love God. You cannot love your fellow man until you love God. Here's the simple truth. We cannot would not even love God apart from Him first loving us. This is the the order of things. God loved us, and we who have loved Him now have the capacity to love others as He has given. This is so lost today. Turn with me to Ephesians chapter 2 just quickly. Because without this truth, none of it makes sense. None of it matters. It's like someone saying, I'm going to have a marriage that doesn't have commitment. Right? There are some foundational realities that must exist for it to be True, real, even remotely possible. And this is one of those things. Listen, this is lost today in Ephesians 2, and we can look at multiple places, but this is one of the more encapsulated places. And this is what I want you to understand. What were the Pharisees lacking? What did they miss? Apart from Jesus, no one can love God. In fact, all oppose and hate Him. Read with me these first five verses of Ephesians. Paul addressing, and and, and remember context, he just came out of chapter 1 where he went through that resounding rendition of of the love of God displayed in our salvation. And he comes to this in in chapter 2. He says, And you were dead 
in your trespasses and sins in which you formerly walked, according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air of the spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience. Among them, we too all. I just want to pause for a minute and help us to understand in the context, in, in, in the grammar and everything that's given here, all, it means all. That's what it's saying. We can also see the same thing in Titus chapter 3, where it says you two all formerly once acted in these ways. It's throughout the pages of Scripture. That means you and I, brothers and sisters, all of us, in varying degrees of display, all of us have lived in our lives at some point in hostility and enmity with God. And he goes on, he says this, in among them, we too all formerly lived in the lust of our flesh, indulging the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, even as the rest. But God, being rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our transgressions, made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved. This is you and I. This is what we were before Christ made us alive by His grace. Listen, really nice, really religious, really peaceful people are not lovers of God, but children of wrath and haters of God apart from Christ. This is a foundational truth to the gospel. This is a foundational truth to our salvation. It is an essential reality that must be soaked in in such a way that we believe it to the core of who we are. Why is that important to our text? Because when we believe and trust the love of God given to us in His Son, then we are not only free to love Him, but when we love Him and trust Him, or by faith have believed that He crushed His only begotten Son so that you and I might have eternal life, then and only then can we love others. Then and only then can we love others. If we try and love others and then love God, there is no overflow of a holy love for us to carry that forward and it will go down in flames. you got to keep the cart behind the horse. Amen. You have to see it rightly. Listen, I always think it's, it's amazing when I think of our missionaries as I'm praying for them and other things and, and they're striving to bring the love of God to people. And some of the opposition they face, we have missionaries that are in a variety of places facing a variety of different oppositions. We have those who are in metropolitan areas and, and they face opposition probably very similar to what we face here. We have those who are in much more remote areas and face a little bit of a different type of opposition than what we probably face here. But it's interesting when people sit and I see them waxing poetically online about these things and, and they speak in terms of missionaries going to, to these poor indigenous people who have lived this way for thousands of years and how dare we interfere with this amazing lifestyle that they have and how dare we come to them and it's spoken about in terms of colonialism it's spoken about in terms of how can we interfere with their way of life which works well for them and I remember speaking to one of our missionaries from PNG that's Papua New Guinea and he addressed that they have so much religion in the country they have so many traditions and so much false worship. They are very spiritual people, so to speak. And he said, within the villages, there's cheating. And murder is a way of life oftentimes. And, and they're haters of one another. That if a man does another wrong, he must do worse unto him. That this is part of who they are and they live in constant fear of what the village next to them may raise up and do. And, and, and in that, we're being told it's hateful to bring them God's love in the gospel that frees them to now love one another. Listen, we can profess to love men all we want, but if we do not love God first and foremost, we will not love men well. You got to keep the horsepower in front of the cart. You have to keep these right. And this is what happens so many times in Christianity today. We reverse these. I mean, they are great commandments. We're going to see the second one in just a moment. Love men. Jesus minces no words. This is the one just like the first, but it's not the greatest and foremost. It's the second greatest and second foremost. 
And here's what happens when you reverse it. You see, it's only through God's love that men can be saved. It's only through God's love that men can have eternal life and hope and peace and faith and all that comes with that. It's only through God. And so when we reverse it and we begin to love men just a little bit more than we're loving God, then we begin to denigrate that which God has given. We begin to take away from the gospel out of a desire that men would receive it and be saved. We begin to change it, distort it just slightly, and we lose it. We lose it. But if we hold rightly our love for God at the forefront and out of the overflow of that true and righteous love that He has given us, we then love men. It will always maintain the order that is necessary. We have to keep the horsepower in front of the cart. But that in no way negates the second greatest commandment from God. Our final point, love men. Love men. Jesus makes no bones about it. The second one is like the first. Right? That's what he says to us in this picture that he's given. He says, the second one is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Now I have to be clear. This one is so hard on my flesh. I can find all kinds of reasons to love me more than others. They're naturally within me. They're always at the surface. Listen, This one I have to recognize. I have to believe by faith that I was an enemy of God before salvation. But I can easily believe that I am an enemy of men by my own experience. It doesn't take much. It's right there constantly. Scripture makes it clear. I love God with all that I am. And then I love men as I love myself. I love that Jesus puts that clarifying point in there. Because the truth is we are lovers of self by nature. We are born self-lovers. We want what we want. We know what we need. We are lovers of self by nature. It flows out of us. Number one, got to look out for, do unto others as we would expect them to do unto us, do unto others first before they get to do unto us. All these things come naturally to us. But God's love flips that around. And it empowers us to love others as He has loved us and given Himself for us. That when we were yet sinners... When we were unlovely, God loved us. When we had nothing of merit to offer Him, He loved us and gave Himself for us. For it's by grace and not by merit that we are saved. If you look in Scripture, it's amazing. Almost every command regarding right relationship with one another flows out of Jesus' love for us. Forgive one another as He has forgiven you. Husbands, love your wives as Christ has loved you. Love your enemies As Christ showed us by entrusting himself to the one who judges righteously and gave himself for us while we were his enemies. The simple reality is that as natural lovers of self, when we receive Christ, we receive God's love poured out within us through the Holy Spirit. Romans 5, verse 5, the second half of the verse, it says, because the love of God has been poured out within our hearts through the Holy Spirit, it was given to us. There is a supernatural reality that confronts our natural reality. Our natural reality is love self. But through Christ and the Spirit, the love of God is poured out within our hearts. It is poured out within us. As you care for your own needs and your own comforts, the question is, do you also care for others? Do you think of others in the way you think of self? As much as you want your needs met, are you desirous to meet the needs of others? I just have to tell you with transparency, this is a convicting section for my heart. As I'm studying this this week and asking these questions, there's much confession and recognition going on of how easily this one slides away. (laughs) Put quite simply, when God loved us, He gave Himself for us. Now God calls us to be His ambassadors or emissaries of His love and displaying it to a watching world. Now, I want to be clear, and and, and the question comes up in other parallel passages like Luke. The question becomes, well, wait a second, but who is our neighbor? Who do we love in this way? What's the second greatest command actually being applied to? Well, I want to put a couple things before us. Jesus never condoned nor comforted sinful behavior. You don't see that happening ever in any of the gospel accounts. Jesus is never go forth and continue sinning. That's never what you see in that. Jesus loves them. He gathers the crowds. He cares for them. But He never condones nor comforts men in their sin. (laughs) 
But he always pointed the way out, and he always carried along those who were willing to follow with him. It's an important truth that we need to separate out from, okay, we're supposed to love our neighbor, and that just means the person who lives next door to us. Or maybe a wider translation that somehow, or interpretation. No, the question is, who is my neighbor? Well, Jesus answers this quite clearly in Luke 12 with the parable of the Good Samaritan. Don't turn there. It's a familiar text. But in Luke 12, the question comes up. Well, okay, you've answered rightly, teacher, but who is my neighbor? And Jesus tells this parable, there was a man set upon by others who robbed and beat him. And the Samaritan coming upon this man who had been set upon by others served the one who had this need put upon him. He he did not go and find the poor robbers hiding in their caves and try and reform them as his neighbors. He did not go and figure out some way to take care of all those whom he met along the road. No, he cared for the one who was suffering and could be cared for. We need to be clear in this. We are those, and Jesus says that at the end, go and do the same. We are to be those who go and do the same. Our neighbors are everyone. We have opportunity to serve in their hour of need as we would serve ourselves. Now, I want to be clear. We need to think about that as we serve ourselves. Too much of this gets lost in translation in this generation. Brothers and sisters, if I had an addiction that was destroying me, I would want desperately for that addiction to be removed from me. I would not, in the heart of who I am, want someone to come alongside and enable me to continue in that addiction. So as we consider what it means to love others as we would love ourselves, be clear what we're speaking of. This is not about just simply throwing out emotional, nice things to do and calling it love. We need to think rightly about how our Lord set this example, and we need to think rightly about how we ourselves would want true love to be displayed in us. And and we can't mince that. We can't mix that. We cannot make sin some way that we, we take this verse and translate it into we serve others in their sin to continue forward in it. That's never the picture that's given in this. As a matter of fact, I believe the greatest love that we have for God is because of his gospel and therefore the greatest love we can have for our neighbors is to share with them his gospel which gives eternal life that's it i mean think about the greatest way to display god's greatest gift is through his gospel our lord notes here that the whole law and prophets hang or depend on these two commandments what does that mean just quickly in closing everything we've been saying if we love god god rightly we can be assured that we will love men rightly. And really everything in Scripture points to these two realities. Brothers and sisters, if you're not loving men rightly, if you've developed some form of love that is not according to Scripture, then it means you're not loving God rightly. Because out of the overflow of that comes the other. So everything hangs on these two. Think about this. If we love God rightly, we will love men rightly. And everything in Scripture points to this. Just consider the commandments. If you are loving God rightly, you will not have false gods. If you are loving God rightly, you're not going to take His name in vain. If you are loving God rightly, idolatry will be far from you. If you are loving men rightly, you will not murder. If you are loving men rightly, you will not commit adultery. If you are loving men rightly, you will not covet nor bear false witness against other men. Consider everything in Scripture hangs on these two truths. I can't come to this passage and not think of my struggle with the church sign. Many of you have probably heard this, but for those who haven't, years ago we used to have a sign out here that we would put letters, you know, words up on. And somehow it became my job when I was in student ministry here to come up with something to put on the sign every week. And at first it was great. I really enjoyed it. It was, it was nice to be able to think through and really put something out that you wanted to have an impact upon those who were driving by and turning in and going to the school and other things. <laughs> but I remember one week, very specifically, I put out on the sign one that I was most excited about, a little phrase, and it said this, love God with all of your heart and then do whatever you want. And you would not believe the pushback that came in these doors. Parents who were dropping their kids off saying, please take that sign down. 
Please take that sign down. You, you, I don't want my kids to even consider that. And they're missing the point, aren't they? If you love God with all of your heart, then whatever you're doing, whatever you're wanting to do, will flow out of that love and it will be good. Because He is good. Do you love, do you, friends, do you know His love for you rightly? You can. He has made it available to you as a free gift to all who would by faith receive it. For those of you who have received it, are you loving Him rightly? If so, it will show in both a desire and action to love your neighbors in the same way that you love yourself. As one who's loving God, you're displaying those things to them. Would you pray with me this morning? Lord, we are so confronted by the simplicity of your word and yet by the action that it demands of us in these very few and simple statements and lord we're confronted by how quickly we stumble and fall how far we can be drawn away by our flesh by our culture by this world and how suddenly we find ourselves justifying things that have no point justifying things that have no place Lord, I come to you thankful today. Thankful for your truth. Thankful for your love. Thankful for the opportunity by your gospel to love you. For I know that in my heart, in my flesh, apart from your gospel, I am your enemy. Apart from your gospel, I am under your judgment and deserved condemnation. Apart from your gospel, I am faced daily with that. Lord, we have been brought to the, to the recognition of some very simple truths just in this season. As we look at statistics and graphs and updates and so many other things, Lord, will we not be reminded today that 100% of us will die and 100% of us will face judgment? Lord, that is the stat that matters. And Lord, You have loved us And you have given yourself so that we would never face that. Let us sing praises to your name today through the light and lens of that reality and that alone. For we ask this in Christ's name. Amen.